Hey guys, Matt Lewis here. A couple quick things before we get to today's podcast. First, we had a great conversation with Bridget Fetisi, but there's even more. There is bonus content, like great stuff, outtakes that did not make it into this video, but is available exclusively for premium supporters at Patreon. I highly recommend checking this out. Go to patreon.com slash Matt Lewis and watch this bonus content and these great fun outtakes from this episode. I also want to say uh, that we do get into some graphic conversation that may not be appropriate for children during this episode, uh, so viewer discretion is advised. Hey guys, it's beloved political commentator Matt Lewis back for another exciting episode of Matt Lewis in the News. Uh, today we have a great guest, Brid Bridget Fetisi, who's coming up here in a moment. But first, I want to thank all of you who support this kind of content on Patreon. And if you don't already support us, please do. Patreon.com slash Matt Lewis. And I also want to give a plug to the Leadership Institute where we are filming today. They're a great organization. Uh, they train conservatives how to be more effective in public policy. If you want to learn how to be a better activist or a political candidate, uh, how to run for office, to be more effective in public policy, uh, you name it, how to get on TV, for example. The Leadership Institute has training for you. Some of it's here in Arlington, Virginia. Some of it is around the country. And some of it is even online at leadershipinstitute.org. Check them out. Bridget Fetisi, <laughs> welcome to the news. Thank you. I was just laughing at how to get on TV. <laughs> That's right. Well, it's we've succeeded. So Accidentally. Mission, mission Accomplished <laughs> Leadership Institute. Um, you are, of course, a writer and a comedian mm -hmm. and the former uh, sex columnist at Playboy. Yes, Playboy advisor. Um, so our first Playboy advisor on the podcast. So Thank welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did my research and I went through and some things that people may not know about you. Uh, a late bloomer. Yes. A waitress. Yes. Former heroin addict. Yes. Sexual assault survivor. Mm -hmm. College dropout. <laughs> comedian writer I said uh, talk about there's wanna, a lot out there and you said and for those listening you've told me that anything's fair game yes, to talk about here fair game. but talk a little bit about how that shaped you and how that brought you here today um yes my podcast that I do is all about grit and resilience and I I always wanted to be a writer when I went to college I knew I wanted to be a writer and I was paying and it was a confluence of events that happened all simultaneously, but essentially I was, doing, I was uh, sexually assaulted the year before I went to college. And then I went to college and realized I wanted to be a writer and was paying for college and then um, also was doing lots of drugs to try and numb a lot of the pain from a lot of years of stuff. And I ended up um, dropping out because I didn't, I didn't want to be in college and pay for it, and I wanted to be a writer, but then I ended up um, going off the rails, as they say. <laughs> and I am grateful because I failed so young. I was a straight A student. I was on the fast track to Harvard. I had everything in front of me, and that was my goal. And I, it was my only goal, really. I just wanted to go to an Ivy League school. And when I, colossally let myself down in high school because I started partying young when I was 12, 13, and I moved a lot, and it was a way of just fitting in, and there was home stuff too. And um, when I just kind of bottomed out so young, and I remember sitting in rehab, and I've had a lot of moments like this, much like this one right now in a little bit, where I'm looking, this is a different instance, and it's not the same as rehab by any means, but looking around and saying, like, how the hell did I get here? How did I, how did I go from having these huge dreams of being uh, whatever I wanted to be in a, an Ivy League school and end up in a state-funded rehab in Minneapolis in a halfway house? Um, it was shocking. And also liberating. It was, I, looking back, at the time I didn't see how liberating it was. But I mean, it has to be, I'm sure a lot of it, the stuff you went through is tragic and you probably wouldn't want to relive it again, but, but in terms of like being an artist, being a writer, and experiencing life, and there's so many people out there who are 
writing, but they haven't really lived much of life. Right. I and mean, you have experienced all sorts of highs and lows, yes. no pun intended. Yeah, <laughs> lots of highs and lots of lows. I, I definitely didn't, after that, my life became unpredictable. Not that it was predictable even up to that point. I moved every year and a half. I was constantly the new girl. I never felt like I belonged anywhere. I always felt like the outsider looking in, which weirdly makes me in this kind of moderate position I find myself in. I feel prepared. Um, I don't. I never really had a tribe or a group growing up, so to, it's not weird for me to feel homeless right now like I do politically which we can get to, but I, I yeah. do feel like at that, I was always, I was really lost by the time I was 19 already. And my parents got divorced when I was 12 and I just lost myself. I really lost who I was. And it took me a long, I mean, I got sober at 35, sober, sober. So I haven't used heroin since I, that first time in rehab when I was 19, I checked myself into rehab. And then I haven't touched the stuff since. However, I use heroin as kind of an excuse to say, well, as long as I never touch heroin again, I can do everything else and I don't have a problem because anyone would have a problem if they use heroin. And that kept me in addiction for a really long time, that self-justification of, well, I'm not using heroin anymore. How do you end up at Playboy? Because I think that's the first time I... Uh, yeah. It was just a few years ago was the first time I heard of you, yeah. and you kind of exploded onto the scene. And I think originally I thought you were probably this horrible leftist that I, that I couldn't stand just because you were associated with Playboy. Mm -hmm. But you really blew up on Twitter. Yeah. But how did that come to be? Twitter is what gave, you know, people say all this stuff about social media, and I'm a huge, I could give a seminar on how to, I tweeted my way into the center of the culture war. That is not even an exaggeration. But I've, I basically got, I traveled around the world, so fast forward many years. I traveled around the world for two years, came back in 2013, again, was completely lost. I knew I, I had been in L.A. grinding, wanting to be a writer, and, and I start, got dare, dared to do stand-up comedy in 2009, so I had been doing that. And I felt like I, I was back to waitressing again after teaching yoga, working with autistic kids. I've had a million different odd jobs, and I came back, and I didn't know anything that I wanted. I didn't know what to do. I went on Twitter. I never really got Twitter. I, even though I've been on since 2008, I never really got it. And I think my first experience, I was sick. It was when, do you remember when um, Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore were competing with CNN for a million followers? Yes. I, a few years ago. I was fascinated. I was riveted. I was in bed sick. And I was riveted by the idea that a celebrity was going to have more influence or as much influence as a trusted news source. And um, <laughs> in quotes, and we, and I was, I couldn't, I couldn't stop looking at the, and so then I started tweeting at them, and I think Ashton at one point said, someone said we should get mosquito nets because they were donating mosquito nets, and I was like, hey guys, if you're, why don't you donate some mosquito nets? And he said, someone said, and I was like, they're listening, <laughs> <laughs> they're they're listening to us. That's crazy having that kind of access yeah. to people who the the, the little sick girl in our uh, studio apartment in L.A. can So that kind influence. of showed you that the power of Well, then Demi the Moore blocked me because I made some joke about how they were going to get divorced, which they did. Yes. And then um, that was, and then I realized I should probably stay off Twitter because at that point I was still drinking and smoking weed and I, I saw pretty quickly that this could just be a lot of trouble for me. Um, after that. Then I didn't go back on until 2013 and I found all of the comedians and the writers from Family Guy and they were hilarious and I found the tribe but I didn't do anything. I didn't engage. I just sat back and watched it 
for two weeks. I read every study I could get my hands on about Twitter and realized also very quickly that this was a drug, and I knew it. I was like, this is a drug. So you spotted that right away before a lot of people, right? Oh, I. I it's dopamine. Oh yeah. You get it. You get, I, when you check. I'm telling you, it's almost like spinning a roulette wheel, too, man. When every time you know yeah. you have to push down on the iPhone and and, and like your your mentions <laughs> yeah. to re-up your mentions. It's exciting. It is, and it's years of evolution of wanting to be popular. I've read so many books about this now, and I took 40 days off Twitter for Lent, and yeah. I really saw the addiction. It was I, the the second day I went and saw my chiropractor guy, and I said, um, "Yeah, I'm off Twitter, and I'm I am I feel the." my receptors yeah. reaching out for that fix. And I know what that feels like. I've quit a lot of things in my yeah. life. And he said, eat cheese. Apparently cheese helps you because it stimulates, it gives you yeah. dopamine. Yeah. And my I eye like, doctor so told me too that cheese like- the night before for a meeting and they all made hmm, fun of me. Cravings, maybe. Yeah. Um, my eye doctor told me that it's really, the iPhones, ever since they came out, it's really bad for eyesight. And I think, you know, Twitter's the, the addiction, but- Oh, right. I, so, so, I took, so I took Twitter off my phone okay. for, a week to sort of get rid of the toxicity. And I'm thinking, I'm gonna put Instagram on instead, right? Instagram's healthier, nice. it's more positive. Yeah. And I'm like, I'll just look at pictures of my friends, it'll be positive. <laughs> and then I'm like, I get bored looking at that. So I said, I'll go to the search function of Instagram and I'll put in sports, cause that's gonna be wholesome, right? I'll just uh -huh. see like baseball. Five minutes later, I'm staring at women in spandex hitting golf balls. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, they these people who run the internet are trying to like suck us yeah, in. Yeah, of course. By of course. feeding us the worst stuff that of they course. want us to see. And the, it is the, the worst, diet. best stuff. Yeah, I, I've become, I try to be conscious of the media diet because you are what you consume. Yeah. You are what you eat, you're also what you consume. So I, I observed Twitter. I went and I watched for two weeks, I just watched and I was like, oh, this is a giant high school. I know how to do this. <laughs> I know how to work. So you, you're telling me that you've been very intentional and strategic. No, I really about your... wasn't. I just understood. I suddenly got it. Okay. I didn't get it and then I suddenly did. It was, I never understood the way Twitter worked. I didn't understand the way people interacted. And then by taking a step back and just observing it, I finally understood that there was the whole, like all of these social media sites, you, there's the, they have their own lexicon, they have yeah. their own inside jokes, you know, subtweeting and all of the, all like the ratio, all the things that people, if you came on there, you would, you would say, the what whole the ratio heck? thing, I think it's such BS. Like I said the other day, I'm like, I'm supposed to like be upset because somehow more people are commenting on something I said than are liking or retweeting yeah. it. Like that somehow, like I think it's a compliment. Well, I wrote something that's more time. yeah, that's there's sparking conversation. Yeah, thank you for your time, this precious lifetime. So it, I, it sounds like I was strategic, but then I feel like I engaged with Twitter much in the same way that I did in high school, which was by being hypersexual. I was very feisty. I was constantly half naked. I, my avatar was me standing on stage. You couldn't really see anything, but I, I did the, this photo shoot when I was in Australia because uh, stand-up comedy to me felt always very vulnerable, and I felt like I was naked in front of the audience. So. I wanted a picture that represented that, and then I used it as my avatar. And then I started trolling, in, accidentally, trolling celebrities, not accidentally. I, my friend said, engage. I was still drinking at the time, mind you, and we were having wine, and she said, I was like, I don't get it, I still don't get it. Even though I read it and I observe it, I still don't understand. She said, well, you have to engage with people. And at that moment, Dane Cook said, um, he had a tweet that said, girls, you know, girls suck a vine or something like that. And I said, you know what? You suck at comedy. How about that, asshole? And we're from Boston. I didn't think it was a big deal. And he retweeted me. And it was like three days of getting mobbed by Dane Cook fans telling me with horrible grammar what a like, ugly loser I was and all. It was my first mobbing. <laughs> now, is this, how did you end up at Playboy? Is, oh, that, is so, that because of Twitter? Yeah, basically. That I always say Dan Cook made me, weirdly, because then my following kind of tripled, and I just kept engaging and was, cons I just was like, I'm gonna build a little audience, one joke and one tweet and one interaction at a time. 
and just have fun with it. And that was it. I just, I, and also, I had tweeted so much about being drunk and being an alcoholic. <laughs> I was like, I think I need to get sober. It was just there in ones and zeros. So Twitter is part of the reason that I could even see I probably need to sober up. So I did, and then kept going. And I think in 2015, somebody put me in touch with, so now it's maybe a year and a half into tweeting, sobriety, waitressing, and just the, the So you're waitressing, but you're being followed and tweeted by celebrities uh -huh. at the same time. Yeah. And, and, you've, and you're putting out this kind of glamorous, sexy image, probably. <laughs> And then it's also waitressing. Oh, I used to, no, so but I would, of, do you ever have anybody come in and oh, recognize you? all the time. You? When I was waitressing, all the time. And I used waitressing to tell people to follow me on Twitter. But I also used to joke about it on Twitter all the time, how people would be like, oh my gosh, I saw you on Twitter. So you were Twitter. upfront about it. You weren't like, you're yeah. not trying to hide this, no, like, no. I'm famous. No, no, no. Okay. Even, even when I was in LA, my friends used to, it used to drive them crazy because I'd be writing or trying to write or trying to sell a script. And they would take me to a party, and people would ask me what I did, and I'd say, I'm a waitress. And they'd say, Bridget, no, you're not. You're a writer. And I was like, what? Ah. Hey, we've all been there. I used to give people my demo tapes and yeah. bumper stickers at, <laughs> while working at the carryout at Watson's Fried Chicken. Same thing. So someone put me in touch with um, the comedy guy from... Uh, Viewer from discretion is advised. Playboy. And then I, at that time, there was an article... Um, why I don't give head going around I'm from Vice. And I was like, well, someone needs to defend blowjobs, <laughs> and that person needs to be me. And so I wrote um, my first piece that I pitched, and they gave me to the culture editor, Joe Donatelli, whom I love and is brilliant, and I pitched why I love giving blowjobs. And that was the first thing that they ever bought from me. It was the first freelance piece I'd sold. And then... <laughs> now, do you view this as part comedy, or is this, like, earnest, like, you're, no, writing for was, the, you're writing for them as your sincere advice? That was me defending... <laughs> Somebody has to do it. <laughs> I, I think hero, saying, hero. American hero. Really, I, mean, I don't know. And so that was me saying... Um, I felt, I felt that they were empowering. That was my whole premise, was that, okay, that's fine. If you don't like it, all right. I understand that, but not all women feel this way, and not all women feel like it's degrading. Some of us feel empowered, and we literally have you by the ball. I made a whole thing. But that was awkward, because I, my dad knew I had been trying to be a writer. <laughs> my poor dad. And I called him, and I was like, there's some good news and some bad news. <laughs> he said, the good news is I sold my first freelance piece, and the bad news is it's about why I love giving blowjobs on Playboy. And he was not very happy about it. Um, he was happy that I was getting work, but obviously he's my dad. He's like, great. That's the first thing he sold. And then... Um, you, let me ask you, though, because, I mean, there was a time when the thing you wrote and Playboy would have been perceived as being like, hey, man, that's liberal, that's, that's empowering, yeah. that's like... Um, that's feminist, yeah. right? But but now, it, in a way, what you're doing is supporting the patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, and, I actually got those right? comments. Oh yeah. So like, in a way, that story. I was internalizing. The I don't want to bring it back I to was politics. Like, literally. But in a way, that's a microcosm of like a larger story where like you would have been a liberal advocating uh, sort of a libertine lifestyle. Um, but now in, what, what is this, like 2015, 2016, yeah. you are actually... right at the dawn of me, too. It was right as that was kind of, that wave was crushing. You're like anti-feminist by their definition. Well, it was actually post, because the first piece I ever got um, that ever got really a lot of traction for me online was something I just wrote on Medium, uh, uh, Bill Cosby raped me, kind of. And it was really just me going through my own experience with sexual assault, which was essentially I got drugged and raped. And so it was very similar. I was 17. It was, um, and yet when, when Bill Cosby came out and all the ladies came out, my gut instinct, and I say this in the piece, was like, really, ladies? Like, all this time? And I had to really look at that. I was like, why, why do I feel that way? And I realized that it was this, I mean, internalized shame, really, that I was feeling about what had happened to me. And I and I really wrote the piece to kind of understand it for myself. I don't always understand things until I write my yeah. way through them. 
And so that was the first thing, and that was me too. Then I got hooked up with Playboy, and I hadn't been online, mind you. I had really been traveling around the world, drinking, grinding, trying to make something of myself in, in LA. And I didn't, I wasn't aware that the culture had shifted as far as it had shifted. So I was getting attacked by people that I, I, I thought I was like, hey, that 90s, I'm 40 now, but at the time I was 35 and I'm like, hey, empowerment. And they were like, no, actually you've internalized the patriarchy and what are you doing? You're, yeah. you're upholding the system. And I didn't, I didn't even see it coming. I had no idea. Yeah, I, I think, and, and you know, you're among a, a, a group of people, like say, like Dave Rubin, for example, mm -hmm. and others. Maybe, maybe even Joe Rogan, who are people who are all about free speech and used to be liberals and right. probably Democrats, but certainly liberals, like certainly not a social conservative. No. Um, but now the world has changed, and you are perceived as being on the right or a conservative. Oh, yeah, and then I, the first piece I wrote, um, so I kept at the, I kept asking, well, it was funny, I, my dad wrote me a letter and said he was worried that I would just be viewed as, you know, a purveyor of smut, fair enough, and I, he wrote me a handwritten letter, and then I wrote a piece about how even my dad thinks I have daddy issues. I'm like, this is probably not a good sign when your dad thinks you have daddy issues. You need to realize everything is content, right? And by the way, dad, you shouldn't have sent that by Raven because my next piece is about how I'm addicted to porn has already been filed. So next time you want to get a message to me, maybe snail mail is not, you know, in the modern era. But after that, I just kept writing for them. I wrote a piece about how um, it's 3 a.m. maybe I need meds about mental, just mental health. And then I did, I kept begging them for a column. And then they said, hey, we have a great idea. Why don't you write a column? And I said, perfect. And the first one I did was um, women date assholes because you're a pussy. Because one of the most asked questions I always get is why do women date assholes? And I wrote this. And again, I kind of stepped into being in the middle inadvertently because now the MRA guys came, the men's rights activists came after me for calling, calling the men in, pussies. The incels. And then yeah. the extreme left came after me because I had said things like, oh, I want a real man. And it was all about how I, I was, again, um, basically internalizing and reaffirming toxic masculinity. Yeah, so let's talk about the um, the Me Too moment and like dating and the Me Too moment. Yeah, and, it's nuts. And how that, well, you know, this is actually a perfect segue, right? Because we were talking about Twitter a second ago. Yeah. You'd sent out a tweet recently. Uh, Alyssa Milano, <laughs> um, also known as Sam from Who's the Boss, uh -huh. was, uh, I guess, encouraging a sex strike. Mm -hmm. and, and you tweeted, um, can someone give Alyssa Milano's <laughs> husband my phone number? I didn't think it was going to take off like that. You know, I, I do treat Twitter very much like a direct line. Usually it's those first gut things that are the ones that I, I have to remember that. Those are the ones that people are like, yes, because it is that just gut reaction to a situation that... That's the comedian in you, <laughs> yeah, and you don't like, want to self-censor. No, and I thought it was just funny because I was imagining it's such a weird thing. We're going to punish the guys who support us. Why, why would you do that? You're, okay, so who, who, I under, one woman said, you know, don't sleep with conservative men. Okay, that makes a little more sense to me, but just a, a general sex strike. I think that's already <laughs> happening. I, I have friends who are younger than me and out there, and uh, I didn't, this is like a foreign concept for me, but um, because of, because I've been married for a long time now. Yeah. But, um, but apparently it's happening. Like there yeah. are women, like if you're, it's like, where do you work? Uh, the RNC, yeah. and it's like, okay, done. Forget it. Like, no, yeah, I'm not yeah. going to talk to you anymore. I hear about this a lot, and men want me to write about this a lot for two reasons. One, they, I, they've had these experiences where if they're libertarian or conservative and they're dating a woman and their family, who might be leftist, will, will try and break them up or come, someone in the family will come down on them for dating someone who isn't on the left. Or they'll be on dating apps and they basically have to just hide the fact that they're libertarian or 
conservative, and the minute a woman finds out that they are, they're basically done. Yeah. But then men also have been telling me they're having a hard time even dating in L.A. I'll go on dates, <laughs> and even a recent one, you can tell they tiptoe around the politics stuff, and this one guy was taking me to a hockey game, and he was like, oh, thank God you're not a crazy left. <laughs> like, he was relieved, like, audibly, like, oh, okay, thank God you're not a crazy liberal. I, he said, it, it, he's like, you're, you're like a unicorn in LA. <laughs> and it's, it is, I think you're there, the I think there are more than they think. I just think everyone who's not, um, and again, this goes into the self-censoring, everyone who isn't necessarily passing whatever purity test to be on in the, in the progressive left or whatever, however you uh -huh. define it. Um, just lays low. They're just keeping, they're on the DL. And when I did Ruben's show, he, I went into, I'm in 12-step programs, and people were recognizing me, and then suddenly women were like, oh, thank God. You know, it was like a secret society. Like, oh, I saw you on Ruben, and not saying it too loud. And just, I'm so happy that we have to go get drinks. So there is this down low, yeah. center left middle center right group of people but they don't feel like they can come out without being and this happens on the right too by the way people who come from perhaps women who are you know come from the conservative side and might I saw this a lot during the Kavanaugh hearings they were DMing me and reaching out and saying they were just disgusted with the way conservative men were talking about um sexual assault, et cetera. And so I see, and but they feel like they have right. to hide it. They can't be open about it. Yeah. This is the problem with tribalism. Totally. So one of the things, I mean, you, being a comedian, we, we've really seen, it seems like a lot of comedians are uh, talking about political correctness yeah. right now. And, and there are some people who, uh, I think I heard you say before, like woke, not joke, or something like yeah. that. Like, <laughs> like there are people who are trying to be very woke and they're just not funny mm -hmm. because like, Comedy tends to be transgressive. And yeah. Comedy, good comedy tends to be like, like offensive on some level, um, and uh, and certainly walking on eggshells is not funny. No. Right? And so it seems to me that like even people like Chris Rock, for example, and and a lot of people like you know um, like Jamie Kilstein, like Dave Rubin does stand up comedy. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean Joe Seinfeld Ro won't Joe do. Joe Rogan. Yeah, Seinfeld won't do um, colleges anymore. Yeah. You know the. I, that There's something scares there. me. There's something there, though, that um, it's it's a good sign. I think that comedians are are coming around on this because Some Hollywood are. and academia is totally on the other side. Right. Well, it, so comedy is supposed to push the status quo. Now, when you become the status quo, and then you're just standing up there preaching or defending it. Now it's just dogma. Yeah. Now you're just you're just we, preaching we to kids, the choir. When we were kids, comedy, like think of Carlin or whatever, comedy would make fun of like you were saying like religious dogma, but now the right. religious dogma is progressivism. Right. They're the ones who right. are basically it's a religion. It is essentially. And they're imposing, you know, they've got their own rites and their rituals <laughs> and their own sins. It's the and worst you can be thing. excommunicated. There's cancel culture. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I think that you, and it's tough because as a comedian, you're generally not going to make very much money. It's a means to, a lot of people are road comics and whatnot, but you're hoping it's a means to an end and that you'll be in a writer's room, you'll get staffed on a late night show, you'll get your own sitcom, et cetera, because it's very hard to pay the bills for if you're not a hugely famous comic. And you can't get those jobs if you are being honest about where I'm not, who's going to staff me in a writer's room? You know, that, there's... Well, the weird thing now is even if the boss hired you, there could be like a mutiny. Oh, there where would be like a Slack the other channel. Like, be, I'm not, I, can't I don't feel safe. Yeah. I, don't feel, I don't feel safe. Yeah. Because Bridget, you are Bridget somehow... Is so Bridget retweeted Ben Shapiro and I yeah. don't feel safe. So I have to ask you, Bridget Fetacy, Fetacy, not your actual last yeah. name. I'm not going to ask you your real name That's here, fine. but... I hear fetacy. I've already been <laughs> since we've been talking openly here. I hear fetacy, and I think fetish fantasy. Yeah. Is that where it comes from? I mean, it was a word that I made up to, weirdly, it was um, 
a word I made up that meant irony squared because I felt like people always misuse irony and it was a moment that when reality becomes parody. Essentially when irony doubles back on itself and becomes literal. However, we are living in the age of fantasy. <laughs> we are living in that, the definition of the word where every, it's what do you do when the headlines read like, read like satire. That is what the word that I made up was a fetishy. And so I had greeting cards and t-shirts and everything reflected this sense of divine humor. The other yeah. way that I defined it, because it's a harder concept, at the time it was, you know, 2006, people were like, huh? Um, it was a moment where you feel like God is laughing at you. I just yeah. felt like I was constantly the butt but of this But you thought divine... it was surreal in 2006. 2019 is off the hook. I but mean, surreal in my own personal experience. Okay. So my life was always very Seinfeldian, and and I do think it's those weird coincidences where it proves there's no such thing as coincidence. And I that was really where the and then the word just I liked the way it sounded, and I played with words, yeah. and I think that somewhere between fetish and fantasy, there is a, just a playful. <laughs> This is almost like uh, what, what's the um, what's the TV show? It's like somewhere between, <laughs> yeah. you know, between fantasy. Yeah. Um, so why? I, I, one question I have is: there's mm -hmm. a lot of things in the world, right? There, mm -hmm. there's there's war mm -hmm. and <laughs> anti-war movements, and there is abortion mm -hmm. and the pro-life movement, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of life and death big issues. I mean, there's there's overcriminalization and criminal justice reform. Um, you seem to have prioritized free speech yeah. as like a defining issue. Yep. And why is that? Because I feel like you can't tackle anything without it. So And free thought. And free thought and and discourse. So if if there is someone saying you don't get to talk, I don't want to hear from you, you have no right to speak, discourse shuts down. So and I do feel like the idea of free speech is that I have to be able to defend somebody who I might vehemently disagree yeah. with. Which used to be a liberal idea. Right. Which is now no longer a liberal value. And I think that's where when people ask me how the left lost me or whatever, I, I think that they left me behind. Yeah. And a lot of people, by the way, not just me, a lot of other people. You're, uh, homeless. You're homeless. I am. The, I'm... It's due process. These, you know, the thing that happened at Harvard with the with the guy who, what was his name this last week? And um, I took Twitter off my phone last week. Oh, but, but he. I have to. I, it's I don't want to get it what wrong. you miss when you take Twitter. Off. I know. If I had to put it back I saw, on, because I like I don't have the luxury of not knowing the Harvard guy. Yeah, you know? I can't remember that. I'll botch the whole story because, and I don't want to do that, but. Um, basic, people are basically being guilty until proven innocent. Well, he, the students don't feel safe because he's representing Weinstein. Okay. And so, he, and he, I can't remember exactly what department he was in charge of, but he had to essentially step right. down from, from this. Which goes against the whole, I remember, you know, John Adams during the, the Boston Massacre, John Adams represented the British soldiers. And, you know, even though he was a patriot, he believed they had a right to a defense and, like right. those used to be like really progressive liberal values, and right. now uh, you're yeah you're the you're the enemy man. Yeah, yeah, so that was the hell that I I really had to. I guess I I was looking at what. So I ended up tweeting my way into the center of this. What happened at Playboy was I started getting realizing I was stepping out of line, but I didn't even know what the line was, and then I was stepping over lines internally with people and that I didn't. Um, that I would hear I would offend people within the office because I, I wrote this piece that they had to change the headline of um, I had men mansplain feminism to me. And it was like, I didn't even realize this was a line I could step over, but they, there well, was a well, lot of outrage. I, I don't understand what was offensive. I had I mean, men. Wait, it's funny that you could write about EJs yeah. and that was okay. Yeah. But this is somehow crossing the line? Well, because I had men write into me, and I said this very clearly at the top. I said, men, how do you define feminism? I was curious how they saw it. And so I had them explain it to me, and then I cut and pasted it a, a definite the idea of feminism in their words. And I think it was the headline that really kind of 
initially irritated everybody. I had men mansplain feminism to me, but it was oh, trying I see. to be So cheeky. the joke is that you're a girl who needs to be explained <laughs> something. And it did not go over well. And but see, like, I mean, I think you and I share, like, this old-fashioned liberal value that's mm. like, hey, man, let's just talk about ideas and be funny and, yeah. and, and like, don't, don't be I so didn't offended. Know. This, I didn't this know. politics of victimhood is, is so interesting. And, right. And I've been, I talked to Jamie Kilstein about this. I mean, like, I think one of the problems that, that some people on the left are going to have in the long run is if you view yourself as a victim, it's super hard to be happy. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, it's, if you don't feel like you have any agency. Right. And so there's a lot of people going around who just think of themselves as being like, they, they don't control the world. People are always out to get them. The man is keeping them down. Right. And this was what I was pushing back against even in, with the, a lot of the Me Too stuff that I was seeing coming, coming out and the, um, you know, there is that, the intersectional feminists pushing back against us old, old guards who I do understand some of what they were saying just because I didn't really fight every fight when every, every person in the restaurant that I worked with touched my butt or whatever. Um, that doesn't mean it's okay. So there is that, um, you know, the younger generation's like, well, just because you old bags are putting up with that doesn't mean we are. Fair enough. I've learned a lot from the younger women in that respect. But in some, in some ways, I feel like it does take, they're giving up their agency by saying that they're just victims of this patriarchy. And by the way, go to India, go to somewhere, go to another country, go, yeah. go to places where there are patriarchies. Yeah, I, real I, patriarchy. Yeah, I was talking yeah. to Cassie Dillon about this when I was in India. I was, there was a, uh, it was a festival and the women were all lined up alongside and they were just standing there just watching and the parade came down and it was like the men were going crazy. They were having so much fun. They were going crazy dancing with elephants and, and you could see that the women probably wanted to yeah. join in and couldn't. And so we have it in the West. I mean, we're the most liberated women on the history of the earth. And that doesn't mean that we don't need to improve some things, but I don't think that we're these huge victims of a oppressive system yeah. that's keeping us down. Um, <laughs> I know one of the things you talk about a lot is self-censorship. Mm -hmm. I think that's a re like a real problem now. Like people really feel like they're walking around on pins and needles, mm -hmm. and like you could say the wrong thing, tweet the wrong thing, mm -hmm. and you could be canceled. Yeah, and it's not a big deal. So I think. Some, something I've been really, I'm writing a piece about the mob, or have been forever for um, the Washington Examiner, but I've been, it's been interesting to think about, not all mobs are bad. So blue checks mobbing each other. If I say something stupid, which I have, and I've been mobbed by the left or whatever, okay, I probably, I can handle that. That's all right. It's when you go for people's livelihood and their job or somebody who has 200 followers and now you have all of these huge people with blue checks and with their thousands of followers piling on an, essentially somebody who's completely overwhelmed. And I think that those kinds of mobs where somebody steps out of line, I hear, I put out a call for a piece I'm writing about self-censorship. -censor and the stories were... A little bit chilling. Just the the mommy who didn't who said something about gender that was wrong yeah. and got kicked out of the Facebook mommy group. Those little things are alienating people. People, especially that I feel like on the left that they need in the coming election. People you don't you don't want to alienate somebody who's going to vote with you. I mean you know, it, it's, it's powerful to be rejected. You know, it, rejection yeah. is powerful. Yeah. And so when you're rejecting people because they're not passing every single purity test that you have, right. you are creating a problem. I feel like in some ways I'm the canary in the, in the coal mine in that respect. And I think that that doesn't mean that I'm not necessarily going to vote Democrat ever again just as a reaction. But it does mean that I have to pause now and say, okay, what are, 
what's going on over here yeah. that you're, that people are literally afraid they're going to lose their livelihood. And by the way, the right does this too. I've heard you say like you feel like you were a regular at a bar. Yeah. And that bar, I, I don't know how you describe yeah, what you're losing, your, losing your, your stool. I was just a regular <laughs> at the bar, and then the bar got taken over by yeah. hipsters and, and, you know, mocktails and... And some craft beers I was in a bar and beards. And, and and like, I was in a bar in Brooklyn three months ago, and there was a guy in there, I swear he had the exact same outfit that I had on in, like, 1992. Yeah. It was, like, as if he saved my, like, very light <laughs> jeans and my K-Swiss shoes. It was very uncanny. Uh, I think I had that exact same outfit. Yeah. Crazy. So that, I did feel you, that way. You I didn't felt leave, like, it's like they, Reagan said I didn't leave the party, the party, the Democratic Party left me. Yeah, it, it just moved. And by the way, some, I, I don't, I don't, I, the right does a lot of this stuff too. I don't like to only say, oh, the left only plays this victim hard card. I see it all the time on the right. We, there's definitely people fueling grievances and fanning this idea of, you know, we're going to be left behind and all this stuff. And, to say that people are marginalized is insane too. So in this, in the a kind of flattening that happens where everything is tribal and binary, I don't have to choose between, yeah. well, people aren't marginalized and now I'm over here with these guys. Trust me, I, <laughs> as, a, as a conservative, is very concerned about the direction of the Republican. I mean, I wrote, I wrote a book called Too Dumb to Fail, right. <laughs> how the Republican Party betrayed the Reagan revolution. Right. I mean, there's plenty of us who spent a lot of time oh, yeah. attacking the right, right fairly, but and you feel like, by the by the same token, like you feel like you need to police the left because well, that's where you come from. Right, and I feel like that is, and as we said, there's plenty of people. There's an entire media and Hollywood, Hollywood academia, and I, I, mainstream media. They're t they've got that, and so I do get a lot of cri fair criticism from the left. It's fair that I. Constantly, I don't, my fair and balanced, they're like, just admit you're a conservative now. And by their definition, I might be. That might be something I just have to accept and I haven't accepted yet. Are you, do you like, ta do you want more taxes or less taxes? Um, I don't know. Pro life, pro choice. <laughs> See, this is an area where, and I'm the most irritating person. For, You're a flaming moderate, is I'm what you a, are. <laughs> I am an extremely, because a lot of these, a lot of the, I don't feel like I know anything. So a lot of what happened was, and this is embarrassing and it's not something I'm proud of. I just was a uh, drunk until 2013, try, literally living every month to month, never had, I was freelance. I never had any idea how I was going to make ends meet. And f until basically like two years ago, maybe not even two years ago. Was I? W well, maybe that gives you a fresh perspective. You wake up in like 2016 and you're like, <laughs> how the heck did this happen? But it's embarrassing because <laughs> I feel so ignorant. So I wonder, I was, I call it factory settings in the book I'm writing. And I, I, I just say I was born into a liberal democratic family. I never questioned that. And I basically was off and running and waitressing. I mean, in many ways, when I hear AOC speaking, I was AOC. When I was 27 years old, I was flaming liberal crazy bartender like i mean i understand the um i think she i understand her cynicism although i feel like my cynicism came from a place of like failing constantly and um hers is a little bit more arrogant like i certainly wasn't like and i'm the savior <laughs> well, the funny thing is she's probably more of like a privileged uh, suburban like yeah. college-educated college background. Maybe more than me. So I, I feel like that's where we differ. But in terms of understanding that being on the ground when you're a bar bartender and you're in the restaurant industry, you are, you're seeing the people. You're seeing the, the downtroddenness. I worked in a resort industry. I saw, you see this, you're, when you're a bartender, you see the suffering and the struggle because that's where the people come. And so I understand that the... The, the American Honky Tonk Bar Association. <laughs> I understand that I have a bleeding heart for sure. I understand the instinct to want to help people. What I don't think I realized until recently and, uh, and just waking up and learning more is that a lot of the things that I thought were helping aren't actually helping. A lot of the policies that... And don't even quiz me on which ones because... 
I, I do see in California a lot of liberal policies that seem to be failing yeah. the people on a lot of different levels. And homelessness, housing, I mean, it, it could, we could go on and on. And the taxes there are insane. So I don't know that I trust the government with more of my money to do what's needed to be done. And I also don't know enough about it to, to offer some brilliant solution either. I feel like po that's why I've become kind of obsessed with following po policy wonks yeah. because I don't, I really, I just, I've been very humbled by my ignorance. And Well, there's plenty of policy wonks out there, probably too many. I mean, uh, <laughs> you bring something different, which I think is this perspective on global trends and, and so. Right. Um, but, but I want to talk um, to you about the moderate thing. But first, I, I do want to go back real quick to the free speech thing because, mm -hmm. you know, it's not. So I think I read Orwell 1984. That really freaked me out. And, <laughs> and I think we're kind of living through that a little bit. But the funny thing is, like, what we're witnessing, there's like there is a version of, a, of an authoritarian regime where there's a knock at the door. And right. you're afraid to criticize Stalin right. or Hitler or whatever because if you do, you're going to be disappeared and, or whatever. I think in North Korea, they don't just kill you. It's three generations. Right. They go after your children and your children's children. Of course, you're not going to get out of line. What we're having now is almost like this. There's no head to it. There's almost like a reputation score. You know, China's starting this, right? Oh, but yeah, the social it's currency, like, it's it, terrifying. It is. We're and, on and our way, though. The SATs are now factoring in things like your adversity score, oh, I forget yeah. what it is. But the point I have is it doesn't matter whether it's a an authoritarian leader who's forcing me to like twist my words and bow, or whether it's like someone on Twitter getting me fired or accusing me of something I didn't do. Or HR, or because HR. you criticize someone's code. I mean, you know, the, it, it doesn't matter why I feel like I have to self-censor. Because someone doesn't feel safe and they report you for not feeling if safe. If I have to do that, I'm not really free, am I? No. I'm and, not really in a free country. And, you know, I see a lot of anarchists and, like, these people are like, oh, you're never free. <laughs> um, well, look, I, hear, I hear that we do. I mean, in fairness, we live in a, in a civilization and I believe in politeness and civility. Mm -hmm. They probably don't. Mm. But then there's a point at which... It's not just politeness and civility, it's servility or something. Right. It, and I was saying self-censorship, censorship starts in the mind. And people say, you know, politics are downstream of culture. You have to create the culture to create the policy. Well, censorship is downstream of self-censorship. When you start putting your head down and being quiet because you're afraid. Everybody it self-censors to a certain degree to be polite. But when you're putting your head down and afraid to say the wrong thing or step out of line or constantly, that feeling of walking on eggshells, that was what I started perceiving. Yeah. Was I was walking on eggshells constantly online with my words. And that is not a good sign. That means that there's something bigger that is oppressing you and that you that is it, that is something that is instilling a sense of fear, whether it's the mob law we've been living under or whether it's, that's the weird thing is normally with, with this, uh, there's, there's an authority. There's somebody that you, and it, with the stuff on the left that I perceive, it's so much more insidious because it's headless. There's no person. It's the idea. It's the ideology of, wokeness or what whatever you the tenets of woke or whatever you want to call it the the religion that yeah. that dogma but nobody's really in charge of it it's like a group that just swarms yeah. and you never know when they're going to swarm and you never really know i i remember the justine sacco thing so well i remember watching this is that. the woman who got on she tweeted something stupid then got on a 2013 airplane, 10 hour airplane ride it to South Africa. It still gives me chills. D turned off her phone, because <laughs> back then you probably didn't have Wi Fi on a plane. Gets off the plane yep. and realizes that the entire world has knows spent her name. The last She's lost her job. 10 hours destroying her. That was terrifying to me. That that moment, I, I remember being online saying, like, guys, I don't think this is good <laughs> at all. And everyone's like, da 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 da. 
And they've done studies that the, when you're around a mob, you lose your ability to think yeah. for yourself. Yeah. And so you're seeing that more and more. And because you're because you're removed from with the virtual reality, you're removed from even the face to face consequences of those actions and the humanity of the people behind that screen, it seems to be even worse. Yeah. It and, does seem uh, to. Anonymity uh, and then the, the crowd psychology. Uh, and scary you, stuff. you make a good point about the reputation because it, it used to be it, you, once you lose your reputation, you can never get it back. And now I don't know whether you go in the direction. I, I always say I had nothing to lose. Every, everybody has something to lose. But I, didn't ha I don't have kids in a school system that are going to be punished for something I say online by a teacher who might have seen it and not like me. I don't have... I don't have a job that I would have to be reported to HR because I was saying something that made someone feel unsafe. So I'm free to say, and maybe that's why there's been what you perceive as this um, explosion in popularity or whatever, that it might just be because I'm saying a lot of the things that people don't feel like they can say anymore. Yeah. And so there, and I get these emails a lot, like, thank you. Thank God. <laughs> Somebody's saying it. Thank you. But... I feel like... A much younger, hipper Roseanne. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, God, if that's where I end up. <laughs> Just on Ambien being racist online. <laughs> so this is my future, Okay, Matt. no, I take, I take that back. <laughs> Let's talk about the raging moderate thing. Mm -hmm. and I talked about with this to uh, Jamie Kilstein. Um, I feel like centrism, we need to make centrism sexy. <laughs> Because the problem is, Make centrism moderate, sexy again. for some reason, moderate feels... Uh, Wishy-washy? Yeah. yeah. But it's really not, right? Like, you could be a really cool person who's just like, hey, man, I don't have strong feelings about that. Or like, <laughs> yeah, I think, of course, I think people should have guns, but probably not bazookas. Right. I mean, like, that's a moderate position. But for some reason, moderates seem... Week or What's something. weird is, you know, AOC tweets about um, centrists and mm -hmm. moderates a lot. And so there is a, I, I get it all the time online. I see what Ruben gets basically being called a Nazi and, or a white supremacist or whatever. And so there is a, an attack on centrism. And I think people misunderstand centrism as this need to find balance. Like, on every issue. Oh, right? I see. I can yeah. see the alt right's point here. No, that's not the way it works. I speak out against white supremacy. It's horrible. It is disgusting, and it's appalling when you know to see the rise in hate crimes and to see the rise in in just the the violence and mental illness, really. So those are things that I'm not like, oh, well, I kind of, like, both sides, I see what they, no. But there are certain things where I feel like because of tribalism, you're losing a lot of nuance. I've been witnessing this, and I hate to even go down this road, but I've been witnessing this the past couple of days with the whole abortion thing. So obviously that's an issue where there isn't nuance. You And what's so interesting to me about it is that there is, both sides believe they're defending human rights. Both sides believe this, about this issue. And so if you believe that you're, and I say this to pro-choicers, I'm like, they believe it's a life. Why, of course they're gonna be outraged. And, and on the, to the right, I'll say, well, these women believe they're defending the fundamental human rights of women to choose what they wanna do with themselves. Now, we're not gonna get into that debate. What, what? Well, I was planning on spending the next hour on that. Oh, but. totally. <laughs> um, let's do it. No, um, because I don't really... They don't call it a fetus bump. <laughs> yeah, so I find that even within that, there are women who are pro-choice, but they might have had the experience and they feel like many mixed feelings about it. There are... Conservatives who are pro-life, this is where I feel like they meet, tr people try and meet in the middle. Now, there, I don't think there's nuance on this issue. You, you will, we will eventually land on one side or another. You eventually have to. But, but I think in, there could be compromise. In the meantime, like example, there has to be compromise. Exactly. There could be what Europe has is 20-week ban. And that then you, seems so... You could have a 20-week ban, and you could have exceptions. <laughs> 20 weeks, by the way... Is a long... Is, like, months, right? I didn't know... So, I'll, again, this is another stuff. things it's that I months, didn't right? know. 
Yeah, that's, yeah it's five that's months. Not, that's... that's not an extreme position. It's like, okay. And then you could have exception for like rape or something. I mean, right. that's to me, so in other words, there is a compromise. And I think the, the, the radicals on all sides, but I think most pro-lifers would welcome that. And that's what Europe, so Europe's supposedly so liberal and, 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 and like sophisticated. Like that's what, so I think that if pro-lifers such as yours truly uh, really advocated that, it seems like a pretty moderate, sensible right. solution. And there, and I guess that's all I'm trying to say is, in the meantime, there needs to be some kind of ability to compromise. But what I hear from both sides is, um, oh, there, there's no need for discussion. Like, that's just it. Yeah. Well, there's no need for this. Okay, well, if there's no need for discussion, you calling somebody, not you, someone online who's saying, well, all these baby killers want to, you know, save the right to kill their babies. Okay, well, yeah. how but are you, know, you, but, but here's how part are of you deal, helping though. bring people to your side? What if there was somebody out there who maybe was pro-choice in their 20s and now has mixed feelings yeah. about it, and now you're calling them a baby killer? You think that that's going to persuade somebody? Or someone somebody? who maybe had an abortion. Right. And now is starting As to maybe, think. But then the minute you call them be, yeah. a baby killer, they're going to, that's not persuasive. But here's part of the reason people do it, because it works. So, like, here's my, my take on, uh, on part of the reason so what we need, if, if, first of all, if we're going to have a moderate politician, that it's possible, but that person has to be super cool and super charismatic. Right. Because the reason is, like, radical ideology is a superpower. If you want to be exciting and get people fired up and, and passionate about you, you've got a few options. One is you can say something extreme. <laughs> right. right. The other is you could be good looking, you could be charismatic. And, 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 but I think you got to have something. Right. You've got to bring something to the table if you want to get traction. And if you aren't good looking and if you aren't charismatic and if you aren't an exciting personality, then like the easiest thing to do is to be radical. Right. And so I think that's part of the problem is that people want buzz. They want Twitter traffic. Right. They want whatever. Right. Look at the Democratic Party right now, the 2020 lineup. <laughs> it's a race to the left. Why? Right, right. Because it sells. Right. And and you're seeing that, you know, it's like the extremes keep getting See, more. You and I have looks going for us. <laughs> we don't have to sell radical ideology. But there's other people. I know, but it's funny because I sometimes feel like such a piece of shit. And I do get a lot of I do get a lot of fair criticism and that it, it's I am constantly questioning myself. It's the nature of my mind. It's why it would have been much easier for me to just go all in and be a, a liberal and be like, bah, 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 whatever, just, you know, enforcing the dogma. And that would have been the eat path of least resistance. My brain wouldn't let me do it. I, it just wouldn't. So, like in good conscience, you could. In good conscience, and probably there's a bit of contrary in it in, yeah. in, in, in me, but it's a, it's a weird. Um, I, it's like I almost have too, too much of an ability to evaluate things from every side. Now that doesn't, and, and so I can see why people would say that's so annoying. You have to yeah. like take a stand on something. There is a truth. I and have that. Pro I mean, I, I have that problem. This will sound like one of those things. Like the worst quality about me is I care, <laughs> I care too much. But I, I think too much. <laughs> but I have that problem as a writer. Right. You know, because like a really good column. Right. Is a strong take that really doesn't say, but on the other hand, right. to be sure. And, 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 but and you already know the arguments that are going to come your way. One of the tricks I learned is I used to write a column sort of as like a, like a, uh, like a lawyer. Uh -huh. It would be like, he's going to come up here and he's going <laughs> to dazzle you with talk about code reds. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I would sort of like figure out they're going to say this, so I need to like pre-butt that and, and get ahead of them and answer any potential. And then I learned, wait a second. It's better if people try to poke holes in my column because then they'll be talking about right. it. Right. And, and so I had to quit trying to basically answer every right. potential concern. And somebody made a great point to me about plant your flag and then when you go out and do your punditry, you can you can talk about those more nuanced points that you probably already considered in writing your column because I have the same tendency to 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 push back against myself. And maybe it's because of going to rehab at 19, and there's this expression of put down the microscope and pick up the mirror. And I love that because it's so easy to be like, you, 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 you. You're all responsible for everything. And I'm a huge proponent of personal responsibility. And 
but to almost sometimes to a fault that I, I will be like, well, I can see it from that side, and I can see it from that side, and I can see it from that side. And I do think that the people who are feeling politically homeless are the people who just are saying, yeah, well, I can, I can see... I can see both sides on some of these issues where there's nuance. And someone said to me, um, you know, there's no money in nuance. And that, it's like you're saying, that the money is in the extremes. The amazing, things that, the amazing thing is that we're both introspective, and yet we've chosen to do this. I don't you know. know. I, <laughs> How did that happen? Because I do, but here's the thing. I think voices like yours, people in your, and the, the never Trumpers, it is our duty to keep speaking out, even if there isn't any money in it, because increasingly they're getting bullied out of the public discourse. Increasingly nuanced, people are coming and saying, when oh. They, listen, when they're coming to get me, I want you fighting for me. Oh, I will. Because it's probably going to happen eventually. Yeah. yeah. Someday I'm going to get a printer, and I'll be able, I won't have to look at my phone to That's read right. questions, but I don't have a printer. <laughs> um, and so I, we, I, we got a lot of questions, a lot of good questions, uh, and I'm just going to read three of them. Uh, Doriano Carta ah. tweeted, uh, ask Hi, her Dad. this, if we were in the pre-social media age, where would you be raising hell? AOL, AIM, MSN, Prodigy, email chain letters? Pre-social media? Yeah. I mean, probably just the beach. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't really online. I was never a gamer. I was really, I used to write carved messages. I guess it was like pre-Twitter. My sister and I used to carve these really feisty messages into the beach, um, you know, like the beach, they were picnic tables at the beach. And we had these, you know, turf wars with the other girls and whatnot and, and fights over boys. And so we would write these feisty things. So that was probably like the, where I decided to start being feisty was uh, in right. real life. <laughs> uh, Don Peonessa says, as a right-leaning moderate, how do I have constructive conversations with my far left friends? I respect the passion they have, but it is the passion that presents civil conversation. It is passion that prevents civil conversation to bridge the gap. How do you deal? Ooh. I don't know. You know, did that because I find that I had a conversation like this recently, and I ask a lot of questions. That's how I have those conversations, because I would say, OK, I understand you think that Trump is Hitler, but why do you think that everyone should turn in their guns? I'm hearing that you think right, I'm hearing. Trump is Hitler. I mean, it sounds ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hearing that you think Trump is Hitler. Why do you think everyone should turn in their guns? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, well, you've but made a valid point. If he is Hitler, we should keep why? our guns. Yeah. We should hoard our and guns. And so I will just keep pushing to try and get a, a logical, non-emotional answer and also trying to stay on, because what happens is, if you're someone who's trying to get, it's all emotional. So you have to really try and stay on point. And it's easy to suddenly feel in those conversations, like, where, where am I? <laughs> I'm taking crazy pills. Where, how did we get here? And I, I think it's just staying really on, on the premise of whatever it is you're discussing. That being said, I also just, really listen because there is it i can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. i do want to fight for marginalized people and pe there are people who don't have as many advantages as some as someone like me and i want to be able to help in any way that i can you so know who's marginalized <laughs> the unborn child <laughs> i'm just saying uh moderate voters.org writes moderates centrists election turnouts have always been problematic they generally don't have the passion that the far left, far right have to go to the polls. Similar question to the last one. What can be done to increase the turnout of these people, moderates? I think it's happening. I think the, the um, extremes taking over and people flocking from both sides like refugees into the center and, not, and being like, OK, that's a little crazy. All right, you're crazy, too. I think that. Uh, if you feel politically homeless or you feel like a moderate, you, and I think Claire from Quillette, Claire Lehman said this, that we need to share the risk. So you and I having a conversation, maybe not seeing eye to eye on everything, but we're at least speaking out 
against our insane wait, does this wing. Wait, does this make me alt-right adjacent? <laughs> wait, am I alt-right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what, how, am I farther right than you? I don't, it's unclear. <laughs> I mean, I'm probably, by definition, I more mean, conservative, but I don't know. But wait, I feel like I'm, I'm still, am I not? I'm like, suddenly, I'm like, where am I? <laughs> um, I think we share the risk in terms of, I, I agree with her in that everybody needs to share the risk by starting to just speak their truth fearlessly. And those things that you're afraid to say, um, maybe start saying them. But don't lose your job. <laughs> Good luck. I, I feel like I need <laughs> a disclaimer like, Bridget Fennessy takes no but don't lose responsibility for you when you lose your job because you said something stupid at work. <laughs> well, let me tell you, this has been a delight. Uh, you're writing a book. Tell us, um, I didn't mention your Twitter feed. I didn't mention we talked about where Twitter. you're, well, we talked about Twitter. How can people, who, we talked about Twitter. How can people who want to follow you or read your stuff or maybe go to your Patreon page yep. or any of that stuff or your podcast? You've got a podcast. How I do. do um, at Bridget Fetasy, P-H-E-T-A-S-Y, is um, where you find me on Twitter and Instagram, although I live on Twitter. And you can pretty much find me there. You can email me, fetasycomedy at gmail. And I have Walk-In's Welcome podcast on Ricochet. And that's all about grit and resilience. And we talk about these bigger themes a lot and yet try to stay a little bit out of the news cycle to give people a break. And you can um, find my writing on Mel Magazine. Playboy is kind of all scrubbed. Um, but I'm around. I'm all. I'm. Yeah. I, I'll get it together, guys. <laughs> I need to get an author page together. This is where I, not my strength. Uh, being the organized, like check out my profile at BridgetFetacy.com. Don't well, do that. Well, this was a delight. Thank Bridget you. Bridget Fetacy, thanks for coming on the news. Thank you for having me.